You know, I've, uh, young people, I've always told you, you know, I can remember being young. I want to prove it to you here. Uh, I'll get down here where you can see. This is Brother Danny and Rita, right here. Huh? Yeah, right, yeah. Her hair is still the same color mine is. Y'all can see. I was I was young. I was young. At some point, now that's me, Rita. And then there's a little inset picture of us now. Notice the difference for me, not only in the color of my hair, but the poundage of my frame. <laughs> I, I weighed, a, yeah, I weighed 169 pounds then, beard and all. And now, about 50 pounds more than that. So, you know, I, I told you before, she said I was just too skinny when well, she took care of that, real short order, didn't she? But uh, anyway, I, I showed that to you. I want you to know something. I'll bring this in a little bit later into, into what we're talking about. But I want to talk to you up to this morning about something that is uh, a, a real problem that you as teenagers and young people are facing today. And that's, uh, we, we talked last week, I talked to the adults about uh, that the Bible does have something to say about people being depressed and depression. And we looked at 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're gonna look there again today. I told you it'd be a two-parter last week. Uh, but I'm slanting it, I feel like I need to slant it a little bit more toward young people. And I think that there's a very good reason uh, that we need to do this. You know that, that teenagers, depression is at an all-time high among all age groups, but teenagers are 60% more likely to suffer from depression than an adult. At any given time, the statistics tell us that uh, number one, it is the it is the most common mental health disorder in the United States among teens and adults both. That 2.8 million youth from the age of 12 to 17 had at least one major depressive episode during the year. Uh, between 10 to 15 percent of teenagers have some symptoms of teen depression at any time. So as you can see, it's, it, it's something that, that we need to address. We need to address it not just in the you know, mental health professions like counselors, but it's something that needs to be addressed, I believe, in the church. And we find in the, in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well, we find people who from their actions and from what's going on, they have have uh, uh, periods of depression. Now, I don't carry around pink Bible, folks. Okay, so don't y'all go home and start thinking this. This is my granddaughter Hannah's, and you know Hannah and I, I she and I have some pretty good conversation, conversations. At some point in time, I take her to school usually in the morning, and and you know who says that an adult, particularly a grandpa. Can't talk to uh, can't talk to their granddaughter, grandson, or son or daughter. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of differences. You can just look at the two of us and you can tell that. But we have some pretty good conversations. Hannah came and sat down beside me Friday morning. About uh, is about I guess about six fifteen or so in the morning, and she had just done. She didn't know what I preached last week at all. But she had just done for a, a youth Bible study the night before a group that she goes to that uh, she had uh, the lesson she had to teach. That's a good thing, I think, let the young people teach from time to time. But, but at any rate, uh, she, she, she was given this. Did Kim give this to you? Okay, Miss Kim, her teacher, gave her this. It's the uh, uh, Teen Study Bible. <laughs> and it has some real good things. I just want to read this to you. Uh, <clears throat> this young lady wrote this fella. I guess he's probably some kind of counselor or maybe a pastor, youth minister. And this is what a, a girl named Mariah said. 
I feel sad most of the time. I cry a lot and sometimes I think about doing something bad to myself. Are these normal feelings? Now this is a real letter. And then uh, he wrote back, Dear Mariah, just about everyone feels a little sad from time to time. But deep sadness that doesn't go away for a couple of weeks or more is depression. It can be very serious. More teenagers are depressed than ever before, which explains the growing number of teens who, have, who take their own lives or try to. You must tell your parent or a responsible adult about your feelings. You know, this I think is so, so important why we as adults, you know, young people a lot of times have trouble approaching us. And, and it, a lot of the time I believe it's because they, the young people think that they cannot approach us and that we will not understand. And we need to do all that we can as adults to try and help them to see that that's not the case. Depression is serious but treatable. Do not seek a permanent, that's the definition, this is the definition of what suicide is. Do not seek a permanent solution to a temporary problem. All depression, young people listen to me here, all depression that you may suffer is temporary. Things change. <coughs> But during Bible times, many godly people suffered with depression. The prophet Elijah is talking about here. I mean, Hannah was teaching from the very same thing I preached from last week. She wasn't even in here. The prophet Elijah was so depressed, he asked God to take his life. You ever felt that way? Uh, I, I can imagine if everybody here was honest, the vast majority of people have felt like, you know, life just didn't worth living. I'm not going to kill myself. But I sure do wish God would take me on home. You can find the rest of this story in 1 Kings 19, which we've been studying. Elijah was stressed out, exhausted, and in danger. But great stress is only one reason people can have depression. Some people have a chemical imbalance. I have uh, a daughter who has a chemical imbalance in her brain that causes problems of depression. Some have experienced a sad event, like a death or divorce. Sometimes people start making some bad choices and start feeling depressed. They don't know how to get their lives turned back around. There are many things that can cause depression. But the best way to deal with it is to get help. Young people, get help. God loves you and he wants you to be happy and live your life. He gave you parents to help you, so let them. This is uh, what uh, this counselor told Mariah. You know, I told you that this, this picture here, I was going to bring it back, back around into the, to the, uh, into the, the message. When this picture was taken, I was probably the age of many of your parents. I was 36 years old. My, what 30 years does to our appearance. <laughs> but this picture was taken on Rita and I's wedding day. We were cutting the cake after the ceremony, which is what this occasion this was. Anyway, let me tell you this. This was after, shortly after, not too long, about a year after, the most difficult time in my life I had ever experienced. You know, most of you know I was Rita's my second wife, my first wife, a number of years before this, had decided to, uh, she wanted a divorce. Number one, she said she didn't want to be married to a preacher anymore. Number two, she said she didn't love me. Now, you know what? That'll make you feel real good, won't it? If that won't send you into depths of depression, I don't know what will. And to compound that, I had two kids with her. Or we had two kids together. And many of you know exactly where I'm going with this. You know exactly what it feels like. 
So, young people, there's a connection here that I'm trying to make with you. You're not the only one. And this picture is evidence that it's temporary. It's temporary thing. It's a temporary thing. Because you see that smile on my face? See that smile on Rita's face? We just got married. We've been married nearly 30 years now, and, and we're still smiling about our marriage. So you see, you can recover from what you think is disaster. I thought, boy, this is the worst thing that has ever happened to me in the world. But the thing is this, God always takes care of us. Let me read you a passage of Scripture here. I, I got my papers. I, I talked to the nursing home. I got all my papers. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, listen, it says this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Elijah, we'll read about it in just a minute. But Elijah thought he was the only one left that was serving God in the whole country. He felt isolated. He felt like there was nobody else who wanted to serve God. And you know, one of the things that is a problem with depression is we feel isolated. We feel like we're the only one. And you know what the scripture says here? That what there's nothing in this life that you will go through that is not something someone else before you have gone through that too. That's what it means when it says no temptation, no problem, no trouble has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. So you just get this thought out of your mind, I'm the only one left. Just like Elijah thought he was the only one left. And not only that, but listen to this. But God is faithful. We need to hang our hat on that, folks. God is faithful. We may not be faithful to Him, but God is always faithful to us. The Bible says, God says, He will never leave us or forsake us. He's always there. He will not let you be tempted, it says, beyond what you can bear. He will not, yeah, we've got a preacher out there. He always smiles at me. He will not allow us to be tempted, it says, or He will not allow us to be tried. He will not allow us to go through a problem that we cannot bear. Now, I tell you what, whenever I was going through the problem I was going through, I thought I was right there at that point where it was more than I could bear. But God knows best. It may appear to you and to me as though I've reached the end of my rope. But the thing is, God is faithful in that He will not allow us to go beyond our ability to bear. When you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God always provides you a way of escape if you just Open your eyes and look at what's right in front of your face. God always provides a way for you to get through that. Now, I didn't, couldn't see that whenever I was going through it, but I'll tell you what, I realized it whenever I was smiling in this picture here. And since then, I've realized it because I could have not asked for a, a better mate, a better wife, than I have now. I mean, we still love each other. But at the time, it seemed hopeless for me. Let me read you this. Listen to this. Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. She said, I'm going to kill you. 
Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. Have you ever felt that way? Well, know this, that 3,000 years ago, a fellow named Elijah felt just like you did. That proves that there's nothing you go through that hadn't been gone through by somebody else before. And I believe God recorded this. You know, God, the wonderful thing, I think, that shows that the Bible is true and not fiction is the fact that it shows not only God's servants like Elijah in the best light, it shows them at their worst, too. Isn't that the way life is? We have good times. We have times whenever our faith is just as strong as it can be. And then we have times whenever we allow our faith to fail. I mean, Elijah had just gone through the, one of the greatest battles, spiritual battles, that anyone in the Bible has ever gone through. He had just won a challenge that he had made 450 prophets of Baal. God had answered his prayer with fire from heaven. I mean, it's one of those, you know, cross the Red Sea, parting of the Red Sea type of miracles. You know, those things that just don't happen that often. Had just happened in his life. You'd think he'd be all pumped up and he would be, you know, just invincible in his faith. But all it took was a woman named Jezebel saying, I'm going to kill you to make him run. Now think about that. Tell you what, young people, life can turn on a dime, so to speak. Everything can be looking great and wonderful. And then you know what? Life happens. And you know why life happens? It's because Satan, the Bible tells us, wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy you. Now, he cannot destroy your soul if you're a Christian. So what does he try to do? He tries to destroy your life here and your witness here for Christ. That's what he's doing to Elijah. Elijah should, Elijah should have been out preaching to the crowds. He should have been out, you know, they just had this victory. He should have been out trying to draw them back in. Those that had, their faith had failed. He should have been out drawing them back in. What's he doing? He goes and he runs. And he goes to the desert. He isolates himself. And what does he do? He goes to sleep under a tree. You know, one of the signs of depression is you just want to sleep all the time. Listen to this. Listen to this. All at once, an angel touched him and said, he's asleep under this tree. This angel touches him. And the angel says, Elijah, get up and eat. You know that scripture I quoted you a while ago? God will make a means of escape. God sent an angel. Now, I don't know. It could have been one of those angels from heaven that flies around with angel wings. But that word angel means messenger. <clears throat> it could have just been some individual that God sent there with a message to Elijah. But it does not matter whether it's one of those winged angels from heaven or one of those human angels that comes into our lives from time to time. The important thing, young people, is this, is that God provided. He sent an angel, the Bible says. And all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals. Now, we can pick on Brother Randall since he's laid up sick. <clears throat> Randall, it probably would have been crawfish. <laughs> We're not yet, right? But there was his favorite food cooked up on the coals. 
He ate and drank and then lay down again. He went back to sleep. Here in just a little while, the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, strengthened by that food. <coughs> he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. Now get this picture, folks. And this is how God helps us to overcome depression. He gives us something to do. And young people, listen to me. If you're depressed, the best thing you can do is get out of yourself and go do something. That's the hardest thing for you to do, is it not? I mean, you just don't feel like doing anything. You don't want to do anything. You just want to lay around and want to sleep. Or maybe you try to sleep and you can't sleep. But the thing is, you just don't want to do anything. Now listen to me, young people. Listen to me, because if you haven't faced this already, you're going to be facing it in your life. I can guarantee you, you will. God gave Elijah something to do. He said, get up and eat. He sent this angel, said, get up and eat. You got a journey. You got some place I'm sending you. And where he sent Elijah was the mountain of God. The same mountain that Moses climbed. And God gave him the law, the Ten Commandments. Same mountain. He gets there and he could tell there was a storm of ruin. So he went into a cave. And we pick up there. With the story. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here Elijah? You know I think sometimes God. You know, have you ever had anybody say. Stop and think about what you're doing. <clears throat> That's what God is doing here with Elijah. He says what are you doing? Stop and think about what are you doing. Elijah replied. Now, I'm going to add a little, a little play acting the way I think. Now, Elijah may not have sounded this way, but, but this, is, this is the way I think it sounds to God. Elijah didn't sound this way to himself, but I believe it sounded this way to God. Here it is, okay? Here's what he replied. Oh, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Y'all remember he hawk <laughs> Glenn, despair and agony on me. Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Glenn, I gotta put the twang in it. Glenn, despair and agony on me. <laughs> I think that's about the way we sound to God. And he's probably up there, you know, trying to contain himself. <laughs> oh, well, it's me, Elijah said. I'm the only one that's serving you. I'm all there is. Well, let's read on. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. Think about that for a moment. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, heard the whisper, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Now, Usually whenever we're having a hard time of it, we're depressed. How do we want God to intervene in our life? The answer. Huh? 
We want that, that, you know, I missed it before, parting of the Red Sea miracle. We want the fire of God to fall from heaven, just like in a few days before, the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed the offering that Elijah had prepared before the people of Israel. Well, think about this. We want God to do that kind of thing. Wake up! Here I am! Here's God! We want Him to come down in a windstorm or an earthquake or we want the fire to fall from heaven. That's the way we want God to answer us. But how did He answer Elijah here? In a whisper. And what in the world does that mean? Why did God do that? Why did he put him through all that? There was wind that was so powerful that it was throwing rocks around. Now that's a pretty powerful wind. Then there was an earthquake. And then there was fire that came through. I don't know if it's like Jerry Lee Lewis, great balls of fire, or what kind of fire it was, but it was impressive. But God was not in any of this. When God spoke to Elijah, he spoke in a gentle voice. You know, God is talking to us more times in a gentle voice, I believe, than in these, you know, part the Red Sea type of miracles. You know, I've told you before <clears throat> that I've reached that age where usually about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, 2 or 3 o'clock dead in the night, I wake up and I can't go back to sleep. But you know, that's really been a blessing for me. It's not that I don't want to sleep. I just have trouble sleeping. But you know what? That's been a blessing to me because what I usually do is I'll get up and I'll go to the living room. Rena's asleep in her bed. The kids are asleep in their beds. Uh, we don't have the dishwasher going or the washing machine going or all the racket that, you know, usually goes around any household during the day. It's quiet and peaceful, and I get out my Bible and I do some studying. And you know what I find? That's when God speaks to my heart. Now, I'm not saying you got to, you know, wake yourself up at 2 o'clock in the morning and wake yourself up. But, you know, what we need to do, I believe, is we need to get ourselves into a, a place wherever we, whatever we have to do and whatever we have to, have to go through for that, where we can hear that gentle voice that God is trying to talk to us in. We want that miracle. We want that loud rumbling, thunderclap, fire from heaven. But God is usually talking to us in a gentle whisper. You know, I think the reason is because he wants us to be purposely straining to hear, to listen. Do you really want to know what God has to say? Or you just want God to rescue you? Do you really want to do what God wants you to do? Or do you want him to do all the more heavy lifting in this relationship between you and him? Now listen to the young people. Think about this. <clears throat> After all this, Elijah heard it. He pulled his cloak over his face. And he heard this voice. And went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? You know, I think a lot of times... God would just ask us, you know, Danny, what in the world are you doing? What are you doing here? All down in the mouth and complaining. Elijah, you're, you're, you know, it's all about you. Woe is me. I, I, I'm, I'm, busy. I'm suffering for the Lord. That thing. Here's, again, you know, gloom, despair, and agony on me, playing like a record. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. 
He's, he is beginning to sound like a broken record, isn't he? The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Now think about that. God isn't talking to you. Maybe you need to go back the way you came. God does not feel real in your life. That old saying is, guess who moved? Guess who ran? Guess who failed? God says, go back the way you came. I'm right where you left me. Go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Now, I'm not going to try to tell you I know how to pronounce all these. I'm just going to say it. You'll think I do. Also, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshah, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Maholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael. And Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. Listen to this now. Whoa, I'm the only one left. Here's what God tells him. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. All whose knees have not bowed down to Baal. And all whose mouths have not kissed him. There were 7,000 in Israel that had not quit on God. And here, why do you think Elijah was thinking he was the only one? Because his eyes weren't open. You know, who was he looking at? He was just looking at himself. He was just thinking about himself. He was so, so, so concentrated on his problems and his troubles that he couldn't see the others that were out there in plain sight that were still serving God. And you know what? That's one thing about depression. You know, it's, it, it's, it's a downward spiral. It's a downward spiral in that the more you think about your problems and troubles, the bigger they are in your mind. Have you ever awakened in the night, you got problems going on, you got troubles going on, and it seems like the more you think about that problem, the bigger it is. I have. And we just think, 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 and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we just can't overcome it. I'm the only one. Why, God, are you allowing this to happen to me? Well, there's 7,000 others that are still serving God, just like you. And maybe they haven't gotten so depressed that they can't see. How do you get over depression? Listen. One way you get over depression is you stop looking at yourself and stop looking at your problem. And you go do something. God gave Elijah something to do. I want you to go and anoint this person king and anoint this person king and, and I want you to anoint this person to be a prophet to replace you when you're gone. Now if you read on, you find Elijah, God just didn't take him right then and there like he asked. There was a period of time that he said, there's going to be someone who replaces you. You know what my job here as your pastor is? It, it, it's so that whenever I leave, things just don't fall apart. Somebody will come in and replace me. Think about that. Kind of like, you ever heard that saying, you know, take your bucket, fill it with water, stick your fist in it, and then draw it out. And the hole that's left in the water is how much you'll be missed when you're gone. We get to thinking, you know, we're irreplaceable and we're so important. And Elijah and then we had gotten to that point. I'm the only one serving you, God. You know, that's got to make, you know, trying to make himself feel better by saying that, I guess. Nobody else can serve you. There's 7,000 others out there. Get out of yourself. Stop looking at yourself and start doing something for the Lord. God has something he wants you to do. But you may be so busy looking for that clap of thunder you don't even see, God. Tell him right now. And something else I found. When I stop thinking about my problems and I start doing something for other people, you know what I found? 
The more I think about my problems, the bigger they get, the less I think about them, and the more I try to serve God and help other people, the smaller they get. Think about that. The first church that I pastored full-time, was a full-time pastor, was down in uh, around Seed Creek Lake, a little place called Trinidad. And I've told you before about a fellow I had uh, who was uh, dying of bone cancer. He was in the Veterans Hospital. I also, I think I may have mentioned about that time I had about three or four widow women who were after my head because I didn't do things the way they wanted me to do them. Okay? Church was growing. You know, doing well. Spiritually it's growing, but it, it, it wasn't according to the, you know, what they thought I should be doing. So they were after my head. I had problems folks. I got up there though at that hospital and they had put Joe, that was the guy's name, they had put him on a floor that had all the amputees on it. Military amputees. I don't know why. I guess they just didn't have a bed. He had cancer. He wasn't an amputee. But they put him on this floor and I could walk down the hallway and the doors would be open and I'd see this man sitting on the side of the bed and his legs were gone from the knee down. I even saw one, both arms were gone. And I thought to myself, you know what? My problems are small compared to these guys. You can always look around and find somebody else. So what do you do? You stop concentrating on your problems and you go to try to help somebody else with their problems. That's what God told life to do. Here's, Elijah, here's what needs to be done. Go do it. And he did. And he got out of his depression. If you're depressed today, or if you become depressed in the future, the Bible that tells you what you need to do. Focus on God. Focus on doing His will. Get busy serving Him. There's plenty of places here at Circle Church. Stop looking at your problems and start trying to serve God here. God bless you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for our young people today that are placed under tremendous pressure. Heavenly Father, I remember in high school, whenever I went to school, uh, we didn't have to worry about somebody getting mad at us and going and getting a gun and bringing it into school to shoot us. We might have a this fight after school or something like that. <laughs> that pales in comparison to what young people would go through today and the fear they have. Heavenly Father, help us as adults, parents, and grandparents. Help us, dear Lord, to have compassion on our young people and to do what we can to minister to them, help them to grow in grace and knowledge of the truth. And I pray for these young people here and for their friends. If they haven't already, if they are not now, they will be going through difficult times and trying times in their lives. They will feel depressed. But Heavenly Father, help them to realize that they are not alone. That you are with them. And help them to be able to hear that, that gentle voice where you speak to their hearts. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. Good to have a visit. We have some first time visitors. Be sure, be sure that they know that they're welcome. Okay? Look around you and notice them. Okay? Thank you. You're dismissed. See you next week.